New Start, uh, of course, has treated many um, physical diseases, um, autoimmune diseases, um, uh, cancer, um, particularly heart disease, diabetes, uh, and uh, those um, uh, diseases have been uh, successfully intervened in many cases utilizing the New Start program. In the last uh, several years, um, Weimar, um, as a result of our coming there, we had started this program in Oklahoma at the Lifestyle Center of America, but then later uh, um, took it to Weimar when the Lifestyle Center of America closed. And uh, we have... <laughs> testing. We uh, have been conducting depression and anxiety recovery programs there. And uh, it wasn't until this morning, uh, and I know this isn't necessarily the audience to, um, uh, to um, speak it, uh, with it about, but we've had many individuals, uh, a little bit about our depression and anxiety recovery program. It fills up, every program that we have fills up. In fact, we have a waiting list to get into that program. And, uh, and so that means it's financially um, feasible, you know, it has a margin and uh, it actually uh, helps the Institute um, significantly. And uh, uh, we only take cash paying individuals um, at this program because uh, insurances only pay limited amounts sometimes. Sometimes they pay, very rarely they'll pay nothing. Sometimes they'll pay 100% of it. But it's kind of all over the map. And uh, there isn't a CPT code established for the program yet. We're working on that. We're publishing some data. And uh, it looks like later on this year, all of that data will be published. And who knows how long it'll be before insurances com companies start uh, paying for this um, uh, when an individual qualifies for the program. And so what we realize is that we're going to need to expand this program to virtually every city throughout America. And there's been people preparing to, or wanting to, um, to put on a program in their local community or to be able to uh, have a lifestyle center to do that. And uh, we have some lifestyle centers who are being actually modified to fit the program. And it wasn't until yesterday when I was here in Korea and recognizing, because the, the, the way the program works best is that you have 20 um, to, at most, 25 guests. But normally it works better with about 20 guests. And uh, we, want, we have always mandated places where you have ready, ready access to exercise. Uh, hydrotherapy needs to be part of the equation, usually in the same building where the, um, where the inn, uh, where the um, people are staying. And uh, as I was going through uh, building yesterday, recognizing it hasn't been used yet on campus in this way, I, my mind started to think on how this could actually um, go forward. Now, at that point in time, I had exercised around campus, but I hadn't gone up the mountain. And this morning, I went up the mountain. <laughs> Uh, Eric and I, and we saw that beautiful lake, and we saw the, uh, uh, the beautiful sights there, uh, and uh, we got some good exercise. Uh, we clocked it on our little uh, place. We weren't able to go all the way to the top. We wish we would have had a little more time to do that, but uh, we went about three miles today, and uh, it was, uh, that's when I started to realize, you know what, this place could actually be utilized for the depression and anxiety recovery program. There would have to be some modifications of the building. We'd probably have to get rid of about five offices in there and turn it into a hydro um, place, you know? Uh, and uh, uh, so that uh, the contrast hydrotherapy could be done there. But th there's, there's modifications that could take place. But uh, I realized, you know, depression and anxiety recovery is more needed in this country than even in our country. You know, your suicide rates are higher than they are in America. They are higher than they are in uh, just about any other place in the world. And uh, so mental disease is quite a, a, an issue. And uh, um, 
I can tell you right now if you held the program, and if it was going to be uh, a program that had our, our research and protocols behind it, I have no doubt that even in Korea you would be able to fill this place for cash only. Um, and, uh, and it would be able to be financially sustainable for the university uh, to go forward. But those are talks I need to have with people that are, um, are in charge of such things. But at least you know um, where I'm at in the process and thinking this through. Today we're going to be talking about emotional intelligence and also its relationship to what? Prayer. Now, uh, I mentioned uh, yesterday that uh, there is a form, it's a, it's a prayer substitute that is being utilized throughout the world for mental illness. And it's actually starting to gain popularity, exponentially increasing. One of the reasons why it's increasing is, I should mention this, medications have their limitation in treating mental illness, anxiety, depression. Studies show in a real-world clinical setting, you'll, you will only get maybe a 28% response rate. This is according to Nature magazine. And, uh, and even that response, normally you have to have other things along with the medicines. You have to have, for instance, a type of counseling that's been shown to be better than placebo called cognitive behavioral therapy, which we utilize in our, um, in our center. And uh, we have to have other modalities as well. And so when things are that limited, Nature Magazine um, recently, in their a big article they put on depression, said that you're more likely to be cured from cancer than you are depression with the available treatments today. It tends to be a chronic illness that waxes and wanes and doesn't really have a solution. And uh, fortunately, this is the, the difference of the program we're running at Weimar. We're finding real solutions where people can actually talk about being cured from this from these illnesses and being highly successful. And so when things are limited and counseling fails and medications fail, people start reaching for straws. And so the straw that's been presented to the world is Eastern meditation and it comes in all sorts of forms. You know, it'll be called mindfulness. It'll be called, um, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different words that are utilized, but basically it's utilizing a self-hypnotic technique where the brain is no longer in beta waves, it goes into alpha waves. And then, if you're an experienced meditator, you get into theta waves. Now, theta waves should only really be occurring when you're sleeping. It's actually healthy to have theta waves when you're sleeping. But when you're wide awake, to have theta waves has some risks, significant risks. And meditation, despite all of the, the uh, research that's been done, they're only looking at benefits, they're not looking at risks. And there are significant risks, and the benefits are very limited, very limited compared to the results that we get using the real form of meditation, where beta waves are present, and where we can have a significant uh, benefit. I'm going to start out um, quoting the ancient philosopher Aristotle. He said, there are many ways to demonstrate anger, and anyone can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person, and to the right degree, and at the right time, and for the right purpose, and in the right way, that is not within everyone's power, and that is not easy. Now, normally we quote with people that we agree with. I can tell you that I don't agree completely with this statement. What part do I not agree with? Anger. <laughs> no, anyone can become angry. I agree with that statement. The start part that I don't agree with is that it's not within everyone's power. It is, once you learn the principles of emotional intelligence. And this is something that we can all learn. What is emotional intelligence? It's understanding your emotions and the emotions of others and responding to those emotions in a healthy way. 
I'm going to talk about prayer and its relationship to this. What is prayer? It's, of course, attempting to communicate with the divine. But I'd like to quote from the book Education that says, prayer and faith are closely allied and they need to be what? Studied together. Now, we have had a tendency, even in the Adventist church, to be great students of faith. We probably need to study it even more. In fact, what is the great theme of enlightened Adventism? Righteousness by, Righteousness by faith. It's something we should all believe in. And that is the enlightened uh, uh, Adventist teaching that, of course, comes from the Bible and from Paul. But Christ and others, it's woven throughout the entire scripture. But prayer and faith are closely allied, and we're told they need to be studied how? Together. Notice this. In the prayer of faith, there is a what? Divine science. There's science in prayer. It is a science that everyone who would make his life work a success must understand. And, you know, our whole idea of putting people through depression and anxiety recovery is not just to recover from those illnesses. It's actually that their life work be a success, that they be fulfilled. We don't want them just to be happy. Of course, it's great to watch that happiness grow in those 10 days. At the end of 10 days, these people are transformed. But we want that happiness to result in fulfillment and in success. And by the way, what is the, what is the, um, the way of measuring fulfillment? Um, sometimes I call it the deathbed test. This is the difference between happiness and fulfillment. For instance, as an internal medicine physician, I've seen a lot of people pass from life to death in an intensive care unit. And I've seen them when they know that they're passing from life to death. And their family knows it. I have never once heard a person say, you know what, I wish I would have watched more Seinfeld. I've never had someone say, you know what, I wish I would have had more chocolate mousse. Uh, or, you know, I wish I would have gone to the amusement parks more. Or, you know, it, those things never, never come up on someone's deathbed. If there is a wish in regards to something, it has to do with their wish that they would have spent more time in fulfilling ways. For instance, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids and grandkids to show them a better way of living. That's very common. I wish, and as you start reviewing your life, you know, you want to have had a life that actually has made a difference, that has moved the people around you forward in a way that, um, that they wouldn't have moved had it not been for your presence. Well, emotional intelligence likely contributes more to successful and enjoyable living than IQ does. And studies show uh, emotional intelligence being learned rather than inherited, it can be improved upon. The five components are knowing our emotions. That means we are accurately identifying what we're feeling and why we are feeling that way. If we explain the why by saying, I am angry because of what you said about me, you are not understanding your emotions. If you are experiencing emotional turmoil, you need to understand that that turmoil that you're experiencing is not just due to what's happened to you. It's actually also due to your thoughts about what has happened to you. And unless you are able to analyze your thoughts, you are not able to fully understand your emotions. Because it's actually our thoughts that cause our emotions and behavior. 
So this is a critical part. We actually spend quite a bit of time in our program after we get through the spa therapy of helping that brain circulation through hydrotherapy and through good nutrition and exercise and those type of things, we spend a lot of time on helping people to understand how it's their thoughts that cause their emotions and behavior. Managing our emotions. People with low emotional intelligence are simply managed by their emotions, moment by moment, day by day. People with high emotional intelligence still have powerful emotions, but they're managing those emotions. Number three, recognizing emotions in others. This is where empathy comes in, a crucial part of emotional intelligence. Managing relationships with others. This is why our happiness is so much related to this, because our happiness and fulfillment does have a lot to do with our relationships. And in the word emotion is the word motion. If our emotions are based on what's true and accurate, they are meant to powerfully motivate us to achieve our goals. Improving emotional intelligence has been shown to help effectively prevent or treat depression, anxiety, phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders, and even addictions such as alcoholism. In fact, studies show that if you just work on getting rid of the addiction, which is what the 12-step program does, you'll have some degree of success in overcoming the addiction. But if you do combine it with a program that enhances emotional intelligence, such as our eight-week program, it will increase the success by well over fourfold. And that's because people, even when they're overcoming addictions, they get into what's called stinking thinking. That's what AA talks about. And uh, they'll often teach them that their worst year of life is going to be their first year of sobriety, and then it will start getting better. But your first year of sobriety should be the best year of your life if you actually don't run into stinking thinking. And that's what improving emotional intelligence can do. Fortunately, it also helps normal people. And so in a group like this, I assume some of you qualify as being in this category. Um, and uh, so it can help all of us, in other words. It helps us think clear, communicate more effectively, fosters unity in group settings, reduces polarizing statements, promotes a happier life. But all of this is accomplished without compromise or sacrificing the truth. In fact, one of the bedrock principles of emotional intelligence is accuracy and truth. Some people will say, well, wait a minute. You said fosters unity in group settings. A lot of people think unity is something that you just have to commit to. And that means that you have to put all of your differences aside. And then you'll be unified. But I can tell you that's a unification that is very superficial and will not last. A true bedrock unity is going to be based on what's true. And that can withstand all sorts of stress. And so the real way of getting to unity is to get to what is true. And people that are emotionally intelligent, truth is very important to them. What are the influences on emotional intelligence? Our genetic makeup has a role to play. Our childhood experiences have a role to play. Our current level of emotional support has a role to play. If we haven't slept for 48 hours, what's going to happen to our emotional intelligence? Is it going to go up or go down? It's going to tend to go down. Poor nutrition can affect it. Illness can also affect it. But for many, these factors are of less significance when compared to the next slide. The studies on emotional intelligence tell us the major influence on it is our beliefs, our evaluation of events, the way we think about problems, and our silent self-talk. These are the moment-by-moment -moment messages that we give ourselves. Our feelings result from the messages we give ourselves. Your and my thoughts have much more to do with how we are feeling than what is actually happening in our life. Let me give you an example. Paul and Silas were beaten with rods. 
They were laid on an irregular dirt floor. Their feet were put up in stocks. They had done nothing wrong to do this, to have this happen to them. But there they are crying uncontrollably in prison and saying, why us, Lord? What were they doing? They had happy looks on their faces, singing praises to God. Why is that the case? Because their thoughts had much more to do with how they were feeling than what was actually happening in their life. Those thoughts were true and accurate thoughts. They weren't pop psychology thoughts that would tell them that just imagine that they're on a beach in, what's the name of it? I want to say it's J. <laughs> say it again for me. Jeju, okay. Uh, that would work for no more than a second. Uh, but uh, they were thinking true and accurate thoughts. And those true and accurate thoughts were so powerful that even under that situation, they could have emotional wellness. I'm going to go through a couple of examples today. This was the leader of a nation who did not ask to be king. A lot of people are mistaken about Saul. They think that God was trying to get at the people for requesting a king. And so let's just give them a king that they're going to regret. Not true. The Lord actually chose the best man for the job. This was a humble man. He would not actually sought, have even sought for the position. Had there been an election, he would have never run to be king. He wouldn't have volunteered. He did have some good leadership traits. He was tall, he was good looking and wealthy. But he was humble. And he was well liked not just by the common people, but by great men. In fact, the Bible says that when Samuel got to know Saul, he just spent about an hour with him. He loved him as his own son. So this was a great guy. This was someone that we would have all enjoyed being in his company. And then after he became king, he became even more humble. In fact, after he was anointed particularly, if you remember, after he was anointed, as he was going back home, he came across some students from Weimar Institute. Uh, actually, it says he came across students from where? The School of the Prophets. And, of course, we're, we're trying to model Weimar after the School of the Prophets. In fact, it was called the Sons of the Prophets. And so this is why we have a mentorship program at Weimar. One of the reasons why we even have a student from Weimar accompanying me uh, on this uh, trip. You know, it's uh, uh, it was to be like a father-son type of relationship. And so... Saul came across these students, and what did he begin to do? He began to prophesy. The Holy Spirit took over him. He was open to that Holy Spirit's leading, and he began to prophesy too. He realized his dependence upon God for this position. Then after he became king, he did some courageous things. Um, that other kings probably would not have done, went out on a limb to save the people of Israel on the corners. He was a hard worker. He had a strong work ethic. But we all know he began to suffer from emotional problems. And research has documented that negative thoughts which cause emotional turmoil nearly always contain what? Gross distortions. The thoughts on the surface appear valid, but you will learn that they are irrational or just plain wrong, and that twisted thinking is a major cause of suffering. What's a major cause of suffering? Twisted thinking. So let's take a look at Saul's emotional issues. Whenever you have emotional issues like this, we need to understand there are distortions and thoughts that bring this about. Now I can tell you, in dealing with mental illness. It's a paradigm shift for people to realize this. This is not something we necessarily teach them on the first day. 
because they think their emotional problems are strictly due to others. Or maybe some bad things that, that they have that they have no control over, like they're not good looking enough, or they don't have enough money, or you know, they are not smart enough to be successful enough. And so, uh, and if they don't blame it on those type of things, then they blame their emotional problems on others. But it's, it's a shift. It's about day three or four that they begin to realize after their frontal lobe improves and we began to teach them these things, that they also have a significant role to play in their emotional issues. Paul's issue was magnification and minimization. This is when you major in minors and minor in majors. And it's not just Saul that has this issue. Obsessive compulsive disorder is purely about this distorted thought. You are very meticulously detailed and important about lesser important things. And then you overlook things that are of grander importance and completely ignore them. And, uh, and so this um, uh, getting rid of that distorted thought, uh, those distorted thoughts that bring that about is the solution to obsessive compulsive disorder as well. But he began to minimize his own guilt. There was a great victory that occurred. Tremendous victory over Agar and his people. And Samuel comes in after the victory, there's celebration, and then he says, wait a minute, you haven't done all that the Lord asked you to do here. And Saul says, why don't you talk about the things I did do right? We actually won. Why are you focusing in on the things I didn't do right? And by the way, there's a good reason why I didn't do this. I would have been unpopular with the people. And you know, kings have to have popularity. By the way, we are fast going to a society today Every natural society will lead towards monarchies. And we're even seeing this in America, where there's no longer a rule of law in regards to the Constitution. We want the president to be able to go against the Constitution in ways that will help benefit, quotes, the common people. And so you need the common people to support you when you are in a monarchical position. That's why all, every communistic society, which is supposed to be for the people, has to have a monarch. And this is why we've got the new laws, the new morality in this land. The new morality is called equality. You won't find it in the Ten Commandment moral law. In fact, you have inequality there. It says, honor your father and your mother. <laughs> That's not equality. Uh, and uh, God's system was not based on equality. In fact, that's what started the whole Lucifer situation. Lucifer thought he needed to be equal. He needed to have the right. And, uh, and so uh, when, whenever you have a morality that's based on equality, you have to have somebody to be able to define what the morality of equality is because it constantly shifts. And so you need to have a monarch in charge of that. And so he can shift with the times. And so this is why society is leading towards these type of things. But Saul knew. He was smart enough to realize he had to have the common people behind him. And he said, if I would have done this, I think I would have lost their support. It wasn't until the punishment came down that he began to own up to it. But even then, it was clear he was owning up to it to try to avoid the punishment. Confucius says a man who has committed a mistake and doesn't correct it is committing another mistake. And that another mistake is worse than the first. I was told something um, here um, yesterday. Uh, and uh, um, actually, the, the student that's with me um, grew up in western China, so he's aware of, uh, of some of the uh, Asian culture things. His parents are missionaries in, in China. And uh, so he has an interest in Asia, one of the reasons why he's with us uh, today. But in talking to uh, others as well, we are talking about some aspects that may have some commonality in the Asian culture, but also some crossover to even other cultures as well. But when you're a leader, 
in an Asian culture, when you make a mistake, you tend to blame others instead of own up to it yourself. And there'll be others fall by the wayside, but the leader can't necessarily fall by the wayside. And as we can tell, Saul had that issue as well. He had made a mistake, but instead of acknowledging his mistake, he didn't correct it. And thus, he was doomed to become a worse person. David Schwartz says, we can turn setbacks into victories. Find the lesson, apply it, and move on. Then look back on defeat and smile. I've noticed that when leaders do this, when they acknowledge their mistakes, and we need to recognize something. Just because you're a leader does not mean you're infallible. We need to recognize that leaders are going to make mistakes. I can tell you as president of Weimar, I've made mistakes. And I like to acknowledge them and let people know that I've learned from this. And what I've noticed is people are, um, they don't like it because some of the consequences of those mistakes, but they are more merciful once you own up to it and you, and you have a commitment to see these mistakes and regard them as beacons of warning so you don't go back on it. We can turn setbacks into victories, find the lesson, apply it, and move on, then look back on defeat and smile. And Ellen White says, if you have made mistakes, you certainly gain a victory if you see these mistakes and regard them as beacons of warning. Thus, you turn defeat into what? Victory. Disappointing the enemy and honoring your Redeemer. So you can turn defeat into victory. The second issue Saul had is what tends to occur naturally with leadership. This is what the Founding Fathers of America recognized. They quoted a phrase, maybe you've heard it, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's a human nature tendency. And although Saul started out as a very humble man, that's why he was chosen by God, because he had tremendous talent and was also humble. But with time, when everyone was coming to him for, can we do this? Can we do that? And you get the idea after time that you're very important and maybe you're the only one that has the superior brain of the Institute in mind. They were coming in with another victory. David was next to Saul after this tremendous victory. And you know, back in those days, it was kind of like ISIS. If you lost a battle, your women were taken over by the other society. And they were treated as slaves. And so the women particularly, probably even more so than the men, had a lot of desire that the right side win. And so they're thrilled because they have their independence, but they're even more thrilled because their husbands and their brothers are coming back in and God has produced this victory, and they come up with this song. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Now I must admit, if I would have been the choir director that day, and Saul's doctor, I would have advised them to choose some different lyrics. <laughs> but were they trying, was the purpose of that song to try to denigrate Saul? No. The purpose of the song was to try to honor the all-star of the battle, and they knew Saul as a humble man. See, this is how he started out. And so what they thought was going to happen is Saul would have a big, a big smile on his face, put his arm around David, and say, yes, I put him in the position to succeed. That's what they anticipated would happen. First time Saul heard it, he wasn't sure he heard it right. Second time, he knew he had heard it right. And this would have not happened had he not been magnifying self. Magnifying self is going to lead to emotional problems. Is not this great Babylon which I have built? Who stated that? Nebuchadnezzar. Did he have emotional problems? Terrible emotional problems. I mean, he wanted to commit genocide on groups of people and, and uh, you know, would get upset as a, at his own counselors and uh, all sorts of emotional issues. And by the way, it took more than a 10-day program for him 
took more than an eight-week program. How long was his program? Seven years. I mentioned it yesterday in the faculty meeting. First thing the Lord did was put him on a plant-based vegetarian diet. In fact, his, his emotional problems were so severe it required just the raw greens for him. And so um, sometimes we have to do that with the really severe cases. Raw greens. It's amazing what can happen with those greens. Uh, fortunately, most people aren't that level of severity. Uh, but, you know, I will exalt myself above the Most High. This was the first cognitive distortion, and it came from Lucifer. By the way, did Nebuchadnezzar's program work? Yeah. It did work. And, of course, there was exercise, hydrotherapy, sunlight. Uh, there was, um, but what finally worked was getting rid of his distorted thoughts and getting rid of that pride that was there. There's a book written by a great clinical psychologist in the United States. His name is William Backus. And he wrote a book called What Your Counselor Never Told You, The Seven Sins That Lead to Mental Illness. And the first sin he mentioned is the sin of pride. And then he gives you an idea as to whether you might have it. Trying to be noticed. Craving attention. Itching for compliments. Needing to be important. Detesting the idea of being submissive. Loathing the idea of admitting to wrongdoing. Strongly opinionated. Being argumentative. Demanding your way. Wanting control over others. Flaunting your individual rights. Refusing advice. Being critical, yet resenting criticism. Being oversensitive. And finally, thinking you have excellences you actually don't have. William Backus says, watch out. You have one or more than one of these. What's there? Pride. And what will follow? Wounded pride. And wounded pride is going to produce its emotional issues. In contrast, we have Christ. Christ was never elated by applause. Out of all individuals, or all human beings, maybe he should have been the one permitted to have some egotism. Actually, you know, he created the world. But yet, despite the fact that he had such wonderful talents, he never allowed himself to develop arrogance or egotism. In fact, he not only could live it, but he also said, said it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. One of the reasons why we should not have applause in our churches is due to this fact right here. We don't want people to get elated by applause. Because what's going to happen next? They're going to start getting some wounded pride down the road. And you know, now we have these applause meters, you know, where you have competitions on who gets the loudest applause, and you know, you feel good about that, and those sorts of things. Christ, even though he may have gotten some applause, he was never elated by it. And notice, nor was he dejected by censure or disappointment. These two are related. If you're never elated by applause, you will never be dejected by censure or disappointment. In fact, she goes on to say, amid the greatest opposition and the most what? Cruel treatment. He was still of good courage. It's, you know, and there's been a lot of people that have come to our program that have been treated very cruelly. In fact, if any of you have lived long enough, I can tell you that you've been treated unfairly at times. We live in a world of sin. We are going to be treated unfairly at times. But as unfairly as you might have been treated, there's someone that was treated with greater opposition and more cruelty. But despite the fact that he had the most opposition and the most cruel treatment, he was still of what? Good courage. And it got down to the fact that he refused to magnify self. 
writer of the Declaration of Independence in America said, nothing gives one person so much advantage over another as to remain cool and unruffled under all circumstances. And if you don't magnify things out of proportion, you won't lose your temper. So we tell people to watch out for the I can't stand it-itis. You remember Saul progressed where he would lose his temper. Lose his temper to the point of wanting to kill his counselor and his therapist. It's a little song we teach him actually at the beginning of the program. We also teach him this because we know the very in a few hours, they're going to be undergoing a hydrotherapy treatment that they might think they can't stand. We use what's called natural shockwave treatments. And so they're in nice warm water and then they get in a cold ice bath for about a minute. And they contrast back and forth, but it's very important actually in helping their brain chemistry to come back. But the little song we teach them is this, I don't like it, I don't like it, it's okay, it's okay, I can stand it anyway, I can stand it anyway, I'm all right, I'm all right. And that simple song teaches them just because they don't like something doesn't mean they can't stand it. And if we get to the point where we think we can't stand something, chances are we are majoring in things that are more minor. There's only one thing a human being cannot stand, and that's death. Everything else they actually can stand. But when they tell themselves they can't stand it, that's when emotions get out of control. Ellen White says, when trials arise that seem unexplainable, we should not allow our peace to be spoiled. However unjustly we may be treated, let not what? Let not passion arise. By indulging a spirit of retaliation, who do we injure? We injure ourselves. We destroy our own confidence in God and grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, when Saul underwent the recommended therapy for depression, he would feel better again for a while. What was his recommended therapy? Music. What type of music? It was harp music. You can't play the harp too loud. One of the advantages of it, why we still utilize it in our program, it's the softer melodies, softer harmonies. Um, you don't play the harp in a syncopated rhythm fashion, you know. It doesn't have a trap drum set that goes with it, uh, which puts you in alpha wave rhythm after about 90 seconds or three minutes, and it's going to actually lead to more emotional issues down the road. This music was healthy, and it would balance his brain out. His frontal lobe would start to come back. But with the underlying causes still active and his pride leading to more wounded, wife, wounded pride becoming even more prominent, he would slip back into anxiety and depression. He would correct his thoughts for a while, but he didn't practice correcting his distorted thoughts. And this is why we have people actually write down on a 3 by 5 card their distorted thought and their corrected thought because they need to get it out and practice it. And it requires some discipline in regards to practicing the correct way of thinking, but I can tell you it is well worth the effort because the more balanced feelings that come about are well worth the effort. Well, finally, when it looked like his life was caving in, he began to pray. And this was when he was facing his biggest challenge in his life. When Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart, what? Greatly trembled. So he not only had depression at this point, what did he have? He had anxiety. Anxiety, of course, is that fear of the future. And with that anxiety, he was looking for help. And he went to the Lord. Is that a good place to ask for help? It's a wonderful place to ask for help. But notice it says the Lord did what? answered him not. Now Saul was demanding the Lord answer him in one of three ways. We can go into those three ways. He wanted to have either dreams, the Urim, he tried that, and he said, I want to be answered by prophets. Beware of when you demand the Lord answer you the way you state he should. If he doesn't answer you, 
chances are he's already answered you and you have not been following his counsel. And so when the Lord is silent on the issue, it's time to go back. Yes, prayer is still good at that point, but at that point, your prayer needs to change. Instead of getting an answer from the Lord, you need to be praying, Lord, what is it that I am not following of your counsel? Is there anything? Search my heart. Try me. See if there's any distorted or wicked way in me. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It's not because the Lord doesn't want to hear us. It's just that the Bible says, both the Old and New Testament, that the Lord cannot lie. I suppose he's a free moral agent. He could if he wanted to, but he puts truth above himself. And he's not going to be where lies are at. So that means in order for him to reach us, we need to be willing to straighten out our lies that we're thinking. And then he can influence us in a powerful way. And the actual word for iniquity means bent or crooked. So this is talking about having crooked thoughts. The Lord can't hear us. And that's why even David in a psalm of repentance, this verse is often not quoted. But David recognized he would have never gone that way, even with the activating event, had he corrected his thoughts into true and accurate thoughts. And he said, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Sometimes we have the purpose of prayer backwards. The purpose of prayer is not to get what we want. If that were the case, we should have the most selfish people in the world be the biggest prayers. It's actually not to change the heart and mind of God. Sometimes I've heard Christians say, you know what? If just more of us pray and inquire, as if God is a democracy, and if there's enough people praying, then I'll say, okay, I guess I'll do it. There's enough of them doing that. You know, uh, God is much more about truth than he is being democratic. Uh, it's not really to change the heart and mind of God. In fact, we're told that the heart and mind of God doesn't really change. <laughs> He's the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. It's to have God change our heart and mind in accordance with his will. And to accomplish the purpose of prayer, this is how we recommend meditation be done in our program. Once people get this idea of distorted thoughts, Take time alone with God. In other words, let God be your counselor. Christ said to go into your closet and pray out loud. In fact, he did this. Sometimes it wasn't a closet. Sometimes it was up in the mountain. And his disciples would look for him and find him and hear him speaking out loud to the Lord. These private prayers. They would be impressed with them. Confess your specific sins, specific distorted thoughts that lead us into it. And also, very important, is to read the Word in your prayer time. I would request that you do two things when you read that Word. When you see a promise, claim it in prayer. And when you see a command, ask if you're in compliance with it. In the last six years, since I've been president of Weimar, we had a situation rise up where we had three people who were high up underneath me that were starting to triangulate. In other words, they weren't getting along and they were kind of vying for position and scheming and things of that nature. And what I had them do is to re get out that great book, Ministry of Healing. I actually talked to them all together and I said, I'm going to send you all away and I want you to take time to read the chapter in contact with others. And I want you to underline in a different pen any command in there and underline in another pen the promises. And I want you to claim those promises in prayer and the commands. I want you to ask the Lord if you're in compliance with them 
And then I want to come back and talk to you individually about what you've discovered in that. What a difference this made. In fact, it's something we not only give to leaders, it's a great chapter in our, for those that have relationship problems, that in contact with others, spending time with the Lord in prayer. And you can start seeing things in yourself that you didn't see before. What I've recognized is people are much better at picking out the distorted thoughts that others have, but they're not very good at picking out their own distorted thoughts. And this is a great assistance. This is meditation that will produce transformation. It's not just going to be like popping a Xanax pill, which is what the world is trying to have Eastern meditation do, to just make you feel, oh, okay, I'm at peace. No. We don't want people to just feel better. We want them to get better. And this is what prayer can actually do. Communicate with God and his word. And have this be our prayer. Search me thoroughly, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked or crooked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Interestingly, David gives those verses after he tells us that God knows him better than he knows himself. God knows each one of us better than we know ourselves. And prayer time can be a wonderful time when he can start revealing some things about ourselves that we don't see, that we can actually start to correct and become better people. Yesterday, I was reading the news, and uh, I haven't forwarded it yet to our staff, but I'm going to. Emotional reasoning is also a second cognitive distortion. I talked about magnification and minimization. I'm going to wrap up quickly with two other distorted thoughts that are common. Emotional reasoning. Emotional reasoning is where you believe that your feelings don't lie. In other words, I'm angry and upset at you, and that proves that you've been cruel and insensitive to me. Does that prove that, because I'm angry and upset? Not at all. I feel overwhelmed and helpless, thus my problems are impossible to solve. I feel on top of the world, thus I am invincible. This is emotional reasoning. And it leads people for quick fix ways to try to change the way that they're feeling. The person that came to mind in the news, I'll just tell you, Uh, was Tiger Woods. We're going to write him. We'll see what happens. But Tiger Woods was going into all the false ways of altering the way he felt. He was going into some of the Solomon ways. Pornography. Live pornography. And you know, just like Solomon, everyone thought he was the happiest man in the world. Everyone thought Tiger Woods was the happiest man. They all envied him. You know, he had made a billion dollars in the sports world. But the man envied is the one to be most pitied. And we realize how his life was not at all happy. And then he got with it, after his divorce, he got with another beautiful blonde woman who's got a lot to offer. And now she has broke up with him. And it was clear that she, he couldn't stay faithful to her either. And yesterday, the news came forward, he had an interview with somebody where he said, I have nothing more in this world to look forward to. Do you know where that leads? Suicidal thoughts. And part of the reason is, you know, he hasn't won a championship since 2008. It has a lot more to do with what's going on up here. Uh, but the other part of it is he now has back issues. And he, after his back surgery, it's been two months, and he can't even stoop down to pick up a ball. And so he has nothing more forward to, to look forward to. And he's been trying the false way of altering the way you feel. There was a young Korean boy that came to our program. He had gotten a four-year scholarship to every Ivy League school in America. And he was in his second year at one of the East Coast Ivy League schools, and he was failing. And his father didn't know why, but his father sent him to our program. And of course, during our program, we found out the reason why. 
He had gotten into pornography and then live pornography and even high dollar prostitutes. He didn't have to pay money for school, but the money he did have, he was pouring into prostitutes. And he thought that if he just did it enough, he would get sick of it and would no longer want to do it anymore. And this was a transformational slide for him. You can never get enough of what you don't need because what you don't need will never satisfy you. You can never get enough of it. And this is why, you know, people think, well, it's not till they reach rock bottom. No, rock bottom, there is no such thing as rock bottom. It continues to get worse and worse and worse. You have to realize you're not gonna get sick of it. You can never can get enough of what you don't need. By the way, some people that are into obesity, they think, well, you know, this is different with food because I'm addicted to food. And I can't go without food, I'm going to die. And I have to remind them, they're not addicted to all food. I have yet to find someone that's addicted to broccoli. <laughs> Why is that the case? Broccoli is something you need. You can get enough broccoli. <laughs> and that's the way it is. With the things we need, we can get enough of, and we're okay. <laughs> but it's the things that we don't need that you can't get enough of, because what you don't need will never satisfy you. This study, randomized controlled trial pornography, after six weeks in both men and women, less interested and less attracted to their partner, more self-absorbed, anxiety went up, less empathy for others around them, diminished ability to foresee consequences, began to live in a very self-centered world, and began to shut down emotionally. And this helps us to realize why in this society today, there's, quotes more fun things to do than ever before in human history. We have more depression than ever before in human history. Because many of these things suppress the frontal lobe of the brain. Dr. Zillman says the negative effects of pornography on emotional intelligence more consistently proven than the links between smoking and lung cancer. And the Bible says no one should say God tempts because God doesn't tempt anyone. Each one is tempted when he is dragged away and enticed by his own evil, what? Feelings. So it gets back to emotional intelligence. And the problem is feelings can lie. So that's why we have to elevate our feelings to our frontal lobe. Jonathan Martinson gives a solution. He says, feelings are much like waves. We can't stop them from coming, but we can choose which one to serve. And we choose on the basis of what is true and accurate. And Thomas Jefferson says, don't bite at the bait of pleasure until you are sure there is no hook beneath. So why we're going to write Tiger Woods is to let him know about our program. We don't want another Robin Williams suicide out there, number one. And number two, we know our program will help him. If he... Um, you know, we, we know it's going to help him significantly, but particularly if he gets rid of this thing that has been such a menace to him of going after what he doesn't need, thinking that somehow he's going to get more peace and happiness, and now he's, he's still only in his 30s and has nothing more forward to look toward. Last story. This was a man who was getting ready for greatness. He was a man of prayer. And after the, the no rain, the brook dries up. And he stays there until the Lord tells him to go to Jezreel. And from there in Jezreel, the Lord puts him on a plant-based diet. Why is that? He was getting ready for greatness. And you know, for those of you in this room who are I know the Lord is calling each one of you to greatness. You might want to consider this. Studies are pretty clear on how it helps emotionally in many ways. But even after the plant-based diet, he still wasn't ready for greatness. It wasn't until he actually proved that he could live with an argumentative, difficult to get along with woman successfully that the Lord said, okay, you're ready for Ahab. If you remember, this woman lashes out at him and says, Elijah, if you wouldn't have come here, my son would be alive. If I would have been Elijah, I would have been tempted to tell her, you know, woman, if I wouldn't have come here, both you and your son would have been dead a long time ago, which is actually true. But instead, 
he peacefully and calmly took it to the Lord in prayer. And when the Lord saw how Elijah handled this woman, said, okay, if you can handle her this way, you're ready for King Ahab. And what a tremendous victory he had with Ahab in the prayer that brought forth the rain afterwards. But 24 hours later, his life is threatened. And it shocked him because he thought, after this victory, my life is secure. And so he took off running, did not wait upon the Lord, but took off running to save his life. And 30 days later, he says this. He requested for himself that he might, what? Die and said, is enough, O Lord, take away my life. So he's running to save his life, and 30 days later, he wants to die. The Lord came, put him on a depression recovery program. If you remember, the angels came and fed him some food. I think there was some flax, flax seed in that meal. Uh, some good tryptophan and tyrosine. Tried to get him out of the dark, into the light, get out of the cave, you know, into the light. You know, get moving, um, get on an exercise program. But what finally helped him was when he came and said four words to him. Do you remember what they were? What doest thou here? It's a good question for anyone that's having emotional difficulty. How did you get here? And this tells us, you know, I mentioned William Backus, the seven sins that lead to mental illness. But it also tells us people can become mentally ill without sin. Elijah had not sinned. But yet, he suffered severe depression. And that tells us that even righteous people can think distorted thoughts that lead them into depression. His depression, when he started talking, it was clear it was based on overgeneralization, which is holding the hypothesis of fact rather than a hypothesis or generalizing from too few instances. What is overgeneralization? It's using limited factual evidence to support a belief that is simply not true. And what was his belief that wasn't true? Do you remember? I'm the only one that has not bowed the knee to Baal. What he should have said is, I'm the only one I know of. But instead, he just knew he was the only one. The Lord let him get by with it the first time, but the second time he had to correct him and say, Elijah, you're wrong about this. You're wrong by a factor of what? 7,000. By the way, overgeneralization is something that smart people have a tendency to do. When you take an IQ test, you, you measure your ability to generalize. But then you have a tendency to overgeneralize, and that's simply what the evolutionary theory is. Notice the definition of it. It's using limited factual evidence to support a belief that is simply not true. And so smart people can fall into distorted thinking traps. Will Rogers says it's not what we don't know that hurts us so much, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. And there's a lot of people that know things for sure and it just isn't so. By the way, did Elijah recover? The Lord told him, after he corrected his thoughts, he told him to do three things that Elijah did not want to do. We don't have time to go into it. You'll have to read about those three things. But Elijah had no clue as to why the Lord was telling him to do this. It seemed to go against the grain. Why are you telling me to do this? I don't want to do it. And in our program, people will want to do 90% of what we tell them to, but there's always about three things that they don't want to do in their home setting. And those three things are directly dependent upon their success in the future. Because it goes against their human nature. It may not seem like natural for them, but just like if you're right-handed and you lose your right hand, it doesn't seem natural at all to write with your left. As you write with it more and more, soon it will become completely natural. And the natural, uh, as a result of it becoming natural and thinking more correct thoughts, what a transformation. And so Elijah not only recovered from depression, he established the school of the prophets, and he was translated without seeing death. The one individual translated without seeing death that is our representative of translation is someone who had severe emotional problems. What does that tell us? The Lord has tremendous sympathy and mercy towards those that have emotional issues. 
In closing, even the thoughts must be brought into subjection to the will of God and the feelings under the control of reason and religion. Our imagination was not given us to be allowed to run riot and have its own way without any effort or restraint and discipline. If the thoughts are wrong, what else will be wrong? The feelings will be wrong, and the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. The Bible says, be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. That means reconstruct your thinking. Get rid of the distorted thoughts. And then Ellen White says, self-discipline must be practiced. An ordinary mind, well-disciplined, will accomplish more in higher work than the most highly educated mind and the greatest talents without what? Without self-control. So, Ellen White talks about prayer but and the importance and necessity of it. But she also says this, it's a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and, and feelings as much a duty as it is what? To pray. So in other words, it's better to change your thoughts and ways and trust in following the Lord's will and not your own than to spend more time praying. I'll close with this study done by the Army in the America. Army researchers were found that when they subjected a group of volunteers to two sleepless nights, the lack of shut-eye seemed to hinder participants' ability to make decisions in the face of emotionally charged moral dilemmas. Some volunteers changed their views of what was morally acceptable after they'd been awake for two days. But this was not universally true, however. Volunteers who at the beginning of the study scored high on a measure known as what? Emotional intelligence did not waver on what they found morally appropriate. That tells us why Christ, who was sleep deprived, who was nutrition deprived, who was water deprived, and had all forms of abuse put on him, physical abuse, emotional abuse, mental abuse, spiritual abuse, with all of that put on him, did he change what he thought was morally appropriate? He did not waver in the slightest because he had that high emotional intelligence that was based on thoughts that were true and accurate. That's why we're told the power of right thought is more precious than the golden wedge of Ophir. So if you have the ability to make all the money in the world or to think right thoughts, what should you choose? <laughs> right thoughts. So I'll close with this text, emotional intelligence that can be improved upon, and Christ said, ye shall what? Know. know the truth. And by the way, this is not just a knowledge of the truth. The Bible, when it uses know, it says, Adam knew Eve, and what happened? They shook hands? No, Adam knew Eve, and the next words are Eve what? Conceived. What type of knowledge is that? It's an intimate knowledge, an intimate association. And so this is the word that he's using here. It's not just our knowledge of the truth, but it's part of us. It's what we're thinking moment by moment, day by day, non-polarized, completely accurate thoughts. You shall know the truth, and what will be the result? The truth shall make you free. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are interested in our health of body, mind, and soul. And we thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, to bring us emotional comfort. And we pray, Lord, that we might be willing to take hold of the science of prayer the, and during this process, you might search our hearts, see if there are any distorted way in us, and lead us in the way everlasting. May we be willing, as Elijah was, to even do the things you ask us to do that we don't want to do, and goes against our nature. Help us to have the trust and confidence in you to recognize that when you tell us things that we don't want to do, it's actually for our best good. And if we do it, we're going to have greater fulfillment and happiness. We thank you for how you led Elijah to recover from his emotional illness. And may we 
be change agents that can help others along the path that leads to fulfillment, success, and happiness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much for attending today. Uh, we're, uh, we're finished, finished for the worship service. So the lunch is not in, in the pine house. house, as your bulletin says. It's right upstairs on the first floor, just one floor up from the uh, entrance here.